Uh, this is a tough audience, so I'll be careful here. Um, so, yeah, a little bit of introduction. John Orr is my name. Um, uh, and Premium Grain Handlers uh, is a company that uh, I was involved from inception. Um, this is our 27th season uh, in this business. Um, we primarily focus on exports of grain in containers. Um, so pulses fit very comfortably in the space that we operate. Uh, we have storage facilities up country. Um, we're just building one at our farm operation in Dandarigan for lupins. Uh, we want to segregate quat-free lupins, paraquat, diaquat-free lupins for the European market. Uh, we supply lupins into the European um, um, veal industry uh, where they have a specific value um, being high protein, low iron uh, for uh, quite specific veal manufacturing purposes. Uh, as a company we're able to chase those sorts of specialty markets where our products have a niche fit and a higher value than general um, um, uh, commodities. Uh, in the pulse space, we, uh, we've had a long involvement and, you know, I, um, I can feel Sadiq's pain here because really Sadiq did a lot of, a huge amount of work when this pulse industry kicked off back in the early 90s and was a really forceful driver of the pulse industry. So um, uh, he put a lot of energy into that and he could see the potential here. The potential still exists. The idea of rotating our soil types with pulses into um, uh, a more sustainable agricultural grain mix still makes as much sense today as it did then. The market opportunities for pulses um, as a healthy, high protein um, vegetable food, um, efficiently produced, low resource input, still has as much value today as it did then. And um, really, it was pioneers like Sadiq that drove this industry in those early days. Uh, and I can feel his pain because we haven't had a lot of progress since. And, um, and um, there's been reasons for that. Um, but what it means as an industry now is we have opportunities to overcome those reasons. And actually this pulse industry has a massive future for Western Australia. And, um, and there's been a big shift in market opportunities, big shift in a lot of the um, um, market um, space. And I think we're going to see some really big opportunities in the future. It'll be frustratingly slow as it happens. And people like David Feinberg are on that now, and uh, obviously Ben Cole. So we're going to see these opportunities like this on a big scale across the world. And we're in a great position to benefit from that. We built a splitting plant ourselves back in those early days where we were turning chickpeas into chana dal and lentils into red splits and those exciting uh, value-added uh, products. But the reality was we then got hit with ascochyta blight and, uh, and our production levels just dropped to the extent where we couldn't sustain a splitting plant, so we closed that down. Um, looking at the markets now, um, we've... Uh, and, and, and I won't touch too much product by product because um, Mary did a great job of that already, so I won't waste your time with it. But um, the, the lupins are largely stock feed, but we're seeing more and more human consumption. But we're seeing specialty stock feed. So um, the European example was a good one. Um, I failed to mention, we also have receival points, our company, in Kellerbaron, Brookton and Wandering, Wandering for our oats 
Caliburn and Brookton multi products. Uh, so we do take a lot of field peas, uh, chickpeas, uh, etc., into our Caliburn operation in particular. But also directly in Fremantle, that site you can see on the uh, slide there is our Fremantle container packing operation. Uh, where we're receiving trucks from growers directly at that site, segregating it, uh, managing the quality, packing that in containers, and we're right next to the container terminal in Fremantle, so we're quite efficiently able to convert it from uh, 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 trucks to containers and uh, ship that out of Fremantle. And that shipping aspect is a big part of the um, marketing story here. So. Uh, the traditional markets that we were sending pulses into 25 years ago, um, the India South Asia market was really the um, the boss of the field peas, chickpeas, um, and uh, lentil markets, and though that that was um, uh, an important destination for those products, but the surrounding areas, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, were a big part of that also. Uh, and then the Middle East was the, um, the boss of Albus Lupins, Faber Beans, and also took a lot of um, um, chickpeas as well. And then vetch, uh, we uh, have a strong birdseed market for vetch as a very specialty birdseed product. Uh, not general stock feed again, high quality bird seed, machine dressed, and um, it fetches a, a quite good value in that sector. But a lot of variables are at play in the marketplace. Um, shipping freight is uh, certainly affecting these things right now. We, uh, to get a, a container into the Middle East two years ago would have cost us US, uh, $1,200. Uh, today, uh, $5,000, $6,000. Uh, if you could get it, actually, the, there's only probably one company that would take it there now. The shipping companies are making a fortune at the moment. The container shipping companies are really, really um, stocking their bags with cash at the moment. And, and to be fair, they've suffered in the previous 10 years, that shipping was a pretty lean game. Um, but they're certainly uh, making hay at the moment. And that whole coronavirus impact on world trade uh, had a fairly big impact on shipping. Initially, everyone destocked those shelves in panic. Um, then a whole heap of government subsidies were delivered and that shelf restocking race um, was phonetic and these shipping companies um, were lining up and um, to really profit from that China to US route and it was wall to wall from, from uh, Shanghai to to, um, to Chicago, it, well, no, actually Chicago is the wrong example, um, California. So that, uh, we had a lineup of shipping companies making massive dollars on those forward rates and then a logistical backlog occurred. Those ships couldn't be unloaded, there was uh, massive container shortages. Um, they, uh, they were all sitting, a lot of were sitting at anchor waiting to be unloaded. There were troubles at the, at the container parks and we saw a massive disruption. In Australia, what happened was the shipping companies couldn't even be bothered waiting for a backload on the containers. So containers come into Australia full with DVD screens and high value goods uh, and they go back empty. Um, unless we fill them up with low value products like grain. So we have this opportunity to backload grain in containers into uh, the marketplace. And that's the only way lower value commodities like grain or products like grain in our case um, will uh, work. Um, 
But because they were making so much money on the forward rate, the shipping companies couldn't be bothered waiting for those empties to fill and, uh, and pay for a backload. They simply took them back empty and maximised their forward rates uh, from China to the US. So that changed the shift. Oh, that also caused a shift in freight. Um, when you're paying so much, and we're, we're getting 25 tonnes into a container of pulses, so you can do the maths on how much that $4,000, $5,000 US um, reverts to. Um, caused a big shift. Uh, into the India, uh, India uh, South Asia region, similar problem, but we laid over the, the top of that the coronavirus problems where we couldn't even get documents to a company, to the banks in India, because the um, uh, coronavirus really decimated the uh, whole logistical chain for a period of time there. Uh, that caused uh, another backlog of freight. The Indian um, um, container yards became congested. Nobody could shift much. And then the shipping companies didn't want to go there anymore. Uh, so again, uh, when they're making so much money on that China to US leg, they diverted resources away from the Middle East region, away from the India South Asia region, into that um, Northeast Asia and Southeast Asian trade. So massive shift, but with that comes opportunities because what we're seeing now is a massive increase in the opportunity for pulses for food in the Southeast and Northeast Asian region, China, um, uh, Korea, um, uh, even Indonesia, um, the, uh, Malaysia, the opportunities in this region for our pulses is massive. And the nice thing about this region is it's back freight. So we can get much cheaper freight there, even in difficult times. So the market volatility that we see in the Middle East and, and South Asia, which results from shipping disruptions, we're not going to see in East Asia, Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. Um, so, and, and, and a lot of that is that snack food and growing food market. The difficulty we're having there is political. Why our federal government decided it was a good idea to talk, start warmongering with our friends there, our trade friends there, is really hard to fathom. Um, that's just absolutely suicidal, biting the hand that feeds you and did a lot of damage to our industry. So, um, fortunately, we're seeing the new federal government with a much better attitude, and so hopefully these relationships can improve for the future. And if they do, for example, China, we still can't, we still can't get chickpeas into China. Um, and when there's not even a negotiating relationship with these people, we're not going to. But they're buying chickpeas that are being shipped from Australia to India into the free trade zones and transshipped from India to China. Uh, and with shipping costs where they are, that tells you how good the opportunity is if we were able to go directly into China. And the demand is going nuts much bigger than our capability to produce. So we have some exciting stuff there in the future, but it relies on our federal government to improve these relationships uh, so that we can capitalise on it. I'm going to move on. Um, prices. You're right, sir, all over the place. Uh, this is the last seven years. Really busy graph, so I'll talk you through it. Product by product on the x-axis. Um, and you can see th these are physical delivered Fremantle prices as at March each year. Um, and Gustafolius lupins. And you can see the price relativities product by product. Um, and Gustafolius lupins, not a huge amount of price volatility there because largely a stock feed uh, market that that's reflected. 
and it's got a good, strong domestic stock feed market. So there's a diversity of markets for Angustifolius lupins. Domestic, export, feed, growing human consumption, pretty exciting, but not massive prices. But we know the benefits to the agronomic system. Um, you can see, uh, better than me, I think, uh, field peas is the next one. <laughs> I'm getting old, my, my eyes aren't as good. Field peas, <coughs> again, quite um, mu a much more narrow price range than some of the uh, higher price products, uh, but still a bit more volatility. Now, field peas has quite a lot of di diversity. Field peas go into a bird seed markets, human consumption splitting markets, um, stock feed markets, and um, and um, a snack food market. So field peas have a huge diversification, domestic and export. So uh, from a grower perspective, you've always got a price for field peas, and uh, and 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 there's good depth of depth of demand there. So another fairly safe product to market. If you if you're a producer, you're going to find uh, someone's in that market every day. Then we get to the more exotics, lentils. Look at the diversity of price there. What that tells you, you know, when you're talking $1,200 one year and $450 the next, um, that tells you that as a grower, at the moment, if you're growing that product, you really need some storage options. And, and there's, there's not always a price either. Uh, in the marketplace. It's quite thin, but depending on freight availability and, and a lot of other variables. Um, and I think the future, there will be a lot more depth here because of this, uh, if, if we can improve this China relationship as, and, and, and the um, growth in the other uh, Southeast, Northeast Asian region will improve this. Um, but uh, at the moment, if you're a grower of lentils, there's some lessons here. Make sure you've got some storage available to you. And make sure you've got a good relationship with your, with your customer. Don't just ring them the day it suits you to deliver and ask for a price. Um, because they're a thin uh, tonnage that's being grown and CBH won't have a segregation for them. Uh, and they couldn't justify it with the volumes we're talking about. So it requires good communication to coordinate the enormous logistics that are involved in, uh, in these pulses. Uh, chickpeas, very similar story, but slightly under the lentil situation. High volatility uh, of price, depending on supply and demand and time of the year as well. So if you're selling it just as the India subcontinent crop's coming off, you're not going to find as much demand as you'll find just before their crop comes off or just before the Canadian crop hits the market, for example. So timing uh, all means that if you're a grower of that product, make sure you've got some storage available to you, on-farm storage. Um, Faber beans, this is a shocker on occasions. You know, there's big periods of times where there's no demand for favour beans apart from your local stock feed miller. And even they're not going to change their ration unless they're a decent quantity. So um, again, make sure you've got storage available to you and, um, and contact your, uh, whoever you're working with on the marketing front. Don't make that your last call. Um, Talk to them before you even start growing the product and work together. I everyone wins that way. It's about communicating. Albus lupins, uh, largely our smaller Albus lupins that are grown in Australia mainly go into the Egyptian market traditionally. You can imagine how difficult that is right now with freight rates where they are. Um, but the demand's actually quite strong. Prices are quite strong landed, so it even does pay for that freight. I'm going to wind it up very quickly. Lent, uh, vetch, bird seed market, quite, quite good markets, less volatility, good depth in that market, bugger all growing. Opportunity to in increase, actually. So the lessons then, I'm, and I've touched on them throughout, 
Speak, if you're growing pulses, speak with the company you're going to work with on selling them right from the start because there is more work in it. That's our Kelleberan operation, by the way, um, just our thousand tonne silos. Um, make sure you've got some on-farm storage available to you so that if the price isn't right because of various reasons and it is it's a dynamic marketplace and it may not be right. You can see how volatile these prices can be, therefore how much it'll punish you if you have to sell straight off the header in a poor market versus if you have the ability to hold that and maybe pick up another couple of hundred dollars a tonne uh, in, a, in three months, uh, it pays for that storage quite quickly. So timing of sales, speak with the person you're working with about that so that you're working together to hit that market when the demand's at its strongest in order to mutually benefit from that. Quality. I've seen, it, it, it really upsets me to see a truckload of really hard work to grow a pulse smashed up through poor harvesting or um, poor handling uh, or poor um, weed control. And as a result, something that's worth a lot of money has to be machine cleaned. And a percentage, you know, you take 10% cleaning loss out of something that's $1,000 a tonne, you're getting smashed. It's much uh, more important to prevent that quality to turn downgrade in the first place. So big lessons there and let's hope if we can work together the new opportunities uh, we can uh, um, uh, help m improve the market price for these products so they compete with those dizzy wheat and canola numbers we're seeing um, and actually help complement the production of those wheat canola products in the future and, uh, and we can make our whole farming system more sustainable and, uh, and more profitable for everybody. Uh, but communication's the key. Thank you. There on, um, sorry, Alan Melton from Grain Growers. Mm -hmm. The graph you had there on prices yeah. and, and the volatility, yeah. if you were, just as more of a statement than anything else, but if you put it, overlay the canola price over that same period of time, very, very stable. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, uh, standing in three and a half tonne chickpea crops and the price was $350 a tonne. Just not attractive compared to the price of canola at the time. So if you wanted to um, provide that bit of education that Sadiq was talking about to those who are new to the game, um, don't understand or don't appreciate the history, um, the stability of the canola price has been a huge factor in deterring people from considering pulses because the marketing risk to the grower is huge compared to a canola price which has been five to seven hundred dollars consistently over a long period of time. Yeah, yeah, I think you're exactly right, Alan. I mean, look, canola prices are, are, are extremely attractive from a gross margin perspective right now. But we've got to... Um, uh, and, and there are extracts in time where pulses are equally... Um, uh, attractive from a gross margin perspective. Um, so it's not a, in, in a point in time, um, it's a tough comparison right now. Um, and you're right that canola's been a lot more stable on price over time, which is very attractive. Um, but it's not sustainable year on year. Uh, you can't grow canola on canola on canola. You're going to kill your, your process. Um, so we need to uh, be considering rotations and um, and managed correctly and marketed correctly, pulses can be uh, a very profitable crop in themselves and uh, more importantly, make the whole rotation even more profitable. So you can still grow those big canola crops and get those big margins, um, but do it sustainably.